We'll be talking about the development of online monitoring tools for molten salt reactor systems. Our goal is to provide information, information that can support design stages, so informing designers when they need to make changes to their system, or information that can be used in development scenarios. If we have a system out, deployed, a real plant running, our online monitoring tools can be in there and provide the type of information that operators need so they can make real-time decisions regarding process control and process optimization. Now, when we start talking about online monitoring, there are a lot of different flavors. There are a lot of different types of questions that online monitoring can go out there and seek to answer. On our team, we tend to focus on chemistry questions. Is uranium present? How much uranium is there? What oxidation state is it in? What type of speciation is it exhibiting? Is it playing with anybody else in the pool that it should or should not be playing with? And to answer those types of chemistry questions, really one of the best tools that we have out there is optical spectroscopy. It's all about taking a fiber optic out to your system, shining light into your system, and looking at how that light interacts with your system. And this approach can give us a lot of chemical information, but it has a lot of other benefits as well. Namely, it's fast, robust, and versatile. Now those three topics, fast, robust, versatile, they are important topics in and of themselves, but we are limited in time today. So I'm just gonna focus on the versatility of optical spectroscopy. I think that'll be of the most interest to this audience, where our team has designed many different optical spectroscopy-based online monitoring systems to look at a wide range of things, where it really relies on the flexibility of this approach. So for example, we've used optical spectroscopy to design systems to go after a huge range of analytes, not just uranium, as I mentioned earlier, but other fission products, corrosion products, waste species, gas streams, and so on. And we've also designed online monitoring systems for a lot of different process types. That includes looking at different process scales, everything from commercial scale, where you're talking hundreds of liters an hour, to lab or development scale, all the way down to micro scale. We've also taken opportunities to design online monitoring systems for a lot of different system matrices. So solids, liquids, gases, molten salts. And for the first part of this talk at least, I want to focus on that gas phase work and how it relates to a collaboration that we've got going on right now between PNNL and ORNL, where we're working to develop an off-gas treatment system for molten salt reactors. Now this is an important project. It's meeting some big needs out there from providing a route to capture the radioactive species that escape the salt into the gas phase to providing us an alternative route to characterizing what's going on in the salt by looking at the gas that's coming off of it. A lot of the design, development, and testing of this system is happening here at ORNL. The point of contact there is Joanna McFarland. Please reach out to her with questions. She's absolutely amazing. But they've already made some major advancements this year already. So they've uh, tested and demonstrated a prototype gas scrubber, and they've made some very big strides forward in the design of an advanced Inconel-based scrubbing system. Now, the overall impact of this work is that we're working to design a deployment-ready off-gas treatment system. And what's even more exciting for me, given what I love to do, is that we are integrating online monitoring at this stage in the game. Now, this is absolutely fantastic for the design process. You can imagine that if we put an online monitoring probe before the gas treatment and after the gas treatment, we can see what's going into the treatment system, what's coming out, and based on those decisions, we can improve our design and optimize the process of that design. But even more important, if we start integrating online monitoring now, that makes it easier when we go out to deployment scenarios to integrate online monitoring later. And again, if these systems are out in a plant, Online monitoring is there providing that real-time analysis that operators need so they understand what's happening in their process and they can control it and thereby operate more cost-effectively as well as safely. We've actually had the opportunity to develop, through this collaboration, multiple forms of online monitoring. We've got one group going on at PNNL and another group going on at ORNL led by Christian Myrie. This is actually really great because the two forms of online monitoring that we're developing are complementary. So at PNNL, we're developing a molecular monitoring approach, uh, an approach that can give us information on species like HF, I2, T2, DF, so on. So those molecular species. At ORNL, Christian and his team are developing an elemental form of analysis. So it can give you things like total iodine, total chromium. And when you combine the molecular and the elemental, what you get is a comprehensive or complete understanding of what's actually in your gas stream. 
so you can truly understand what's happening and you can truly control and optimize for it. Now I'm going to talk about both of these systems. I'm going to start with the PNNL system. Our goal here with our molecular spectroscopy was to do at least a proof of value or proof of principle demonstration on iodine, one of many species of interest in the off-gas stream, and we started there. And when we knew we were going after iodine, doing molecular spectroscopy, we said we want to start with Raman spectroscopy. A lot of different ways to skin this cat, but we like Raman a lot. It's all about taking your probe here, and you can simply put it into your gas line or whatever line you're looking at, shine a low-power laser in there, and look at how that laser interacts with your sample. But what we really like about Raman spectroscopy is that it's a very mature technology. It's been around for a long, long time, which means pretty much all the equipment we need is commercial off the shelf. It's easy to get, easy to maintain, easy to replace. It's also extremely flexible. We know that our proof of principle goal was iodine here, but we want to go beyond that. We want to look at things like HF, T2, and so on, and Raman can give us that information as well. Now, even more importantly than all of that, with our proof of principle demonstration, we wanted to knock it out of the park. We knew that with Raman spectroscopy, we would have beautiful signatures for iodine. You can actually see a cell right here. This is our Raman probe integrating the cell that contains I2 in there, and you can see that strong, beautiful specular response. If we look at the actual data that we'll get out of that Raman system, you can see this here. This is a Raman spectrum. For those of you who love it, it's super fun. For those of you who don't care about optical spectroscopy, there are two big take-homes here. We've got a strong signature, and we've got a unique signature, which means we can uniquely identify the presence of I2 in the gas phase. Even more importantly, if we zoom in on some of those bands and we look at how those bands behave as we alter the pressure of I2, the partial pressure or concentration of it in the gas phase, we see that as we go from zero to higher pressures, that band grows in, which means we can take the intensity of that band, plot it as a function of the partial pressure of I2, and we can get a calibration curve indicating that not only can we identify the presence of I2 in the gas phase, but we can quantify it as well. Now, I2 is not the only potential species of iodine that we might see in the off-gas. There will be others. We wanted to look at some examples, so we picked ICL as an example to look at. And we, of course, started off by looking at the Raman spectroscopy. We got the beautiful signature that we can use to identify and quantify, but we also wanted to take the opportunity here to switch things up and look at some of the other options that we have available to us. Raman is one form of molecular spectroscopy, but there's also FTIR, Fourier Transform Infrared Spectroscopy. It's very similar to Raman, very complementary, but it looks at the system just a little bit differently, so you can get different kinds of information out of it. So we used this to look at ICL, and we, of course, got a very nice gas phase signature of ICL, but we also got a ton of other information that was pretty exciting. We could get the signature of the condensed ICL, and we could even get the signatures of HCL in there, which is a decomposition product of ICL. So we could get a ton of information out of this system right here and potentially have the opportunity to get even more, so other chemical species or indirect temperature measurements. So we've got a lot of opportunity space here. So overall, we're showing that online monitoring based on optical uh, spectroscopy for molecular characterization is a powerful route to give us information about the molecular species in the gas phase. And there are a lot of ways for us to provide this type of information. I showed you Raman and FTIR. You can build systems that focus on one, the other, both, whatever. They're both mature. They're both commercially available. But most importantly, with all of this work, we've set ourselves up really nicely for the next steps, which is taking this and advancing it, building that deployment-ready system that operators need out there to answer their questions about process monitoring. I don't want to dig into those next steps yet because I do want to talk about what our collaborators are doing at ORNL. And again, this is Christian and his team. They are developing an elemental analysis system based on LIBS, laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy. LIBS is pretty fun. It's all about shining a laser into your system, creating a very, very tiny plasma that breaks up your sample in there so you can get the elemental signatures off of it. You can get a ton of information on this. Like all systems, there's pros and cons. But what I really want to focus on are the advancements that Christian and his team have made. So specifically this last year, they've completed the design of a measurement cell that will let them complete LIBS measurements of aerosols. So you can see right here their measurement window, the line for feeding in their aerosol sample. They've been testing this on aerosols. So you can see the sample cell here and their aerosol generator right here. 
with their system colored green so you can actually see what's going on with it. And they've taken the opportunity to go ahead and demonstrate how they can use collimating cover gas to control the flow of that sample and get it to go through their measurement chamber very nicely. This not only improves their measurement ability, but it keeps the sample off their windows that they use to interrogate the system so they don't have anything plating out on that window and otherwise interrupting their measurements. They've had the opportunity to demonstrate a couple of different measurements on this, and here's an example right here looking at chromium. So they looked at the chromium signature right here, and then they took that signal intensity, plotted it as a function of the concentration of chromium, and again, they're demonstrating here that not only can they identify the presence of chromium, but they can quantify it in there too. Hopefully you'll remember the iodine calibration plot I showed you earlier. Both of these plots are univariate analysis. It's all about picking your favorite wavelength and plotting the response of that wavelength as a function of concentration. Now, if our next step is to produce an online monitoring real-time analysis tool for operators, we don't want to be relying on this form of traditional analysis. It's simply not robust. It doesn't stand up if you have interfering analytes. It doesn't stand up if you have complex chemical systems. We want to take it to the next level and use advanced data analysis to output numbers that we can trust. And so that's a big thing that we do at PNNL. Of course, testing the equipment is what we did this year. Next thing is to actually design the system that will take that spectral data that we're collecting and turn it automatically into information that operators can use. Now, there are several steps in this. It all comes down to the secret sauce right here, which is chemometric modeling. Uh, that's basically a fancy term for machine learning. And in lieu of going through the math behind how machine learning or chemometric modeling works, though we can if folks are interested, I'm going to give you an example of how we've used chemometric modeling in online real-time analysis deployment scenarios for process control. Now, the example I'm showing you here is not from the off-gas stuff, but this is where we want to go with it. This is a demonstration that we did at PNNL this last year. It was for a co-decon process. This is a liquid-liquid extraction scheme. We don't need to talk about the details. I do want to tell you the goal was for us to monitor the product coming out of our separation scheme and use that information to control what that product was. Our goal was to produce a very specific product and produce that in real time throughout the course of our entire run. Now, what we did is we put probes on the product stream. And what you can see right here is the spectral data that we monitored as that product stream flowed past our probes. Now, I think this is super cool because I'm a spectroscopist and I like to stare at this kind of stuff, but nobody wants to pay a PhD 24 hours to sit there and monitor a process. They don't want the data, they want the information. So that's what our system does, is it takes that data, it applies those chemometric models in real time, and it outputs information that operators can use. So what you can see here is a picture of the screen that we were running while we were also running this whole process. And you can see in the background the real time output of uranium concentration in our system, as well as the ratio of uranium to plutonium in this process. The operator used this information to control the process. And I've replotted the data to show you how it was used here. The real goal of this work was to control that product stream so that it came out at 70% uranium, 30% plutonium. That's what the horizontal dashed lines represent is the goals of this work. And if we look at the percent composition as a function of time and look at the solid blue line, that's what we were measuring in real time for uranium composition. The solid red line is what we were measuring for plutonium. Now you can see, when we started out, we were well outside the bounds of that 70-30 goal, as measured by the online monitoring. Based on that, the operator said, I'm going to tweak this flow rate so I can get the system back into prime operating conditions. Every vertical dashed line that you see is where the operator made a change based on the online monitoring results. You see we made several up at front until we finally got that zoomed in to that target range and held it at plus or minus 1%. Online monitoring enabled that. Now there's another very cool feature of this plot, and that is the circles, squares, and triangles on here. Now those circles, squares, and triangles represent grab samples. Every time we grabbed a sample and sent that off to the lab for analysis, two very exciting things. First thing is those numbers line up very nicely with what we were measuring online. So we're very accurately measuring the concentration and composition of this stream. Even more exciting, our online monitoring results were coming out every 30 seconds. Every 30 seconds, we could tell you how much plutonium was in that stream, how much uranium. 
Those grab samples didn't come back for two weeks in the best case scenario, some of them even longer. So without the online monitoring, we never would have been able to produce this product stream. We never would have been able to control it. So we're making huge strides forward in enabling these technologies. And our next step is to take this into the off-gas treatment system. Now, with this work that I've been talking about, there's a couple of big things that we're doing. Of course, I want to emphasize the impact of how we're developing this off-gas treatment system and how we're integrating online monitoring now, not only so that we can improve the design process, but so that we can enable deployment of online monitoring systems when we deploy the real system in the future. And overall, all this work that I'm talking about really comes with the goal of supporting the efficient design, licensing, and deployment of molten salt reactors. And I do want to say that this work in no way is the only work that's out there supporting that goal of improving that efficiency. You've already heard a couple of really great talks before this, and you'll hear a couple of great ones after this about other work that's going on to support this. We even have additional work happening at PNNL, again, towards that goal of improving the efficiency of this. Uh, this work is happening under an internal investment at PNNL, where our real goal is, is to start developing the capabilities to enhance our fundamental understanding of what's going on in a molten salt system so that we can use that to build tools that are needed. So for example, we're taking the opportunity to develop online monitoring systems for the salt melt itself. Again, very similar to what we're doing in the off-gas phase, but in this case, we're looking at the salt directly. And you can see some of our initial work here where we've been designing systems that can look at the salt. This is an example from a lithium chloride, potassium chloride eutectic, where we're, we're getting the signatures for uranium-3, uranium-4, we're looking at plutonium, and other species of interest. This can not only improve our fundamental understanding, give us tools to do that, but is laying the groundwork for developing those online monitoring systems. We also have some other pretty exciting work going on, and I probably don't have quite enough time to go into detail on this, so I'll just highlight it. We're also going after creative solutions to waste management, looking at a lot of different options and opportunities to forward this work. And we're even looking at some things like looking uh, for creative solutions for fission product capture, so xenon capture. A lot of fun stuff. I'd like to start wrapping up, and I want to say something that everyone here already knows. Molten salt reactors represent an amazing opportunity to meet our energy needs. However, there are still some advancements out there that if we can get a handle on those, we can more efficiently support the design, licensing, and deployment of these reactors out there. And the national labs are actively working to get those advancements that are needed, whether that's in technology or in understanding of these systems or even in training the next generation. And I really had to throw in the next generation so we could show off some pictures of our students here. But we're going after that out at the labs. With that, I'd like to thank our funding sources, our team, and, of course, all of you for your time and attention.